Here we are again, folks. I'd like to bring to your attention this one lady in the Bible called the Samaritan woman. She's not named. Yet, she has gone down in the annals of history. Jesus was walking from on the Jericho Road and the disciples and they came to the road that veered off and went through Samaria. And Jesus said to the disciples, I must go through Samaria. And the disciples said, no way, Jesus, no way. We're Jews. We do not go near the Samaritans. They're outcasts. We don't have anything to do with them. Jesus said, you go ahead around then if you want to. I must go, I have an appointment there at a well in, at, there in Samaria. And as Jesus rested by Jacob's well uh, near the village of Sychar, a Samaritan woman came and the, to the well to draw water. She was startled when Jesus said, give me to drink. Jewish custom was very strict and regarded to a man conversing with a woman in public. That wasn't even done among the Jewish people, that they conversed with a woman in the public. Furthermore, as the woman pointed out in her reply, the Jews regarded Samaritans as outcasts and had no dealings with them, none. You see, the disciples wouldn't even, wouldn't even walk on the road. They chose to go several miles out of the way walking rather than to go through Samaria. Well, Jesus would teach her that his message knew the boundaries. His love embraced every human being. He then further uh, stated the, to the woman by dealing that whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up unto everlasting life. Wow. The woman was deeply impressed and asked for this water that Jesus can give. Rewarding her for her good disposition, Jesus led her in steps further in his lesson by showing his knowledge and uh, of her personal life, he laid the foundation for her belief in him. Now he had knowledge that she didn't know about, that he knew about. Jesus knows every person. He knows us from the beginning to the end. Do you know that he could go back to the day she was born? God in heaven and Jesus have a record of every person born. And they have that record. They have the record of conception. Study the Bible. Study the Bible. Before they were born, Jesus and God said many times, like you're going to have two sons. And they're going to be Jacob and Esau, he told Rebecca. You're going to be, have two sons, Jacob and Esau. And it was true. And he, he, uh, uh, when Eve had her boys, God knew who they were. He knew what was going to happen. He knew them from the beginning to the end already. He told her that she had had five husbands. And he, whom she lived with now was not her husband. The woman then declared that he was a prophet. Jesus therefore proceeded to teach her the full truth about himself. Yes, indeed, he was a prophet. He was the Messiah. She said these words to him while he was talking with her. He said, how could you know these things if you don't be that one that is to come to the house of Israel, to the Jews? Jesus, the Messiah. He said, I am he. And he clarified that. At this point, the disciples who had gone into the village to buy food returned. And the woman hurried off to tell her neighbors of her experience. Now, Jesus had told her 
go and bring the village, bring the village back. And she did. She brought the village back. They saw such a change in her, she was able to persuade them to come back with her. The woman heard her off tell her, right, Come, she cried to them. See a man which told me all the things I ever did. Is this not the Christ? They came back to the well with the woman, and Jesus taught them. And many of the Samaritans of the city believed on him. This was a walking revival. He walks into the town, and he has a revival in the town. And many of the Samaritans, listen, the Jews spurned him. They spit on him. They put him on the cross. And here's a, here's a woman that's half Jew and half somebody else, something else. And as far as the rest of the world would say, this is a harlot. She's had five whole husbands. She's lived with a man now that ain't her husband. Who would talk with her? I wouldn't even have a conversation with her, they would say. No way, Jose. No, I don't think we ought to even speak to this woman. She's defiled. And Jesus said, I am the forgiver of defilement. And he said, I tell you, you're forgiven of your sin. Go and sin no more. I guarantee you that afternoon, if she stayed with that man, she married him and didn't sin anymore. She respected that forgiveness perhaps better than some of us do. We need to be careful of that. In the back of the little book that I happen to be in right now, there's a poem that with an unknown author. It said, I took a piece of plastic clay and idly fashioned it one day. And as my fingers pressed it, still I moved and yielded to my will. I came again, days were past, a bit of clay was hard at last. The form I gave it, still it bore. And I could change it now no more. Then I took a piece of living clay and gently formed it day by day and molded with my power and art a young child soft with a yielded heart. I came one year were gone when years were gone. It was a man I looked upon. He still that early impressed bore, and I could change him nevermore. It ended right there, and it says, Poet Unknown. I have a son. I have four sons. And some of them fit this description greatly. They fit it greatly. Because there's always one a step above. If I put this on the air and one of the others see it, they'll think it isn't love. But it is. A fact's a fact and true is true. And not everybody's going to be the same uh, in the family. There's always going to be one. But you know, here I am, a man had been married uh, 56 years. I went with my wife three years before I married. So 59 years, we were pretty much together. And she, the Lord has seen fit to take her to heaven. So I look at many things now a little different. And I have this other poem by Douglas uh, Molek that I'm going to read. A woman's love is like a light. Shining the brightest in the night. The stars all day patrol the sky. But only when the night is nigh, we comprehend the splendor. So a woman's love we hardly know, 
until some moment when we need a hand to help uh, and a light to lead, then woman's love is love indeed. A woman's love when life is best is happy as the happiest. Sing with a singer, with the gay joined in the gladdest songs, but in the hour of grief her voice, when there is little to rejoice, takes another tumble when the symbols are all still again, speaks with the angel song to men. The woman's love is good to own in hours of joy, but he alone knows a woman's love, how deep, how strong, who has had hurt and loss and wrong. Perhaps he hardly knew he had her love when all her love was glad. But he shall learn who love may slight. A woman's love is like a light shining in the brightest in the night. Wow. We're learning. We're practicing. We're practicing daily how to live as a single man. Practicing daily. After 50-something years, my, my uh, statement to you would be, if you're in the same boat, get in the Word. Get in the Word. Get in the Word. Get in the Bible. Get in the Word. If you don't, you'll fail. You'll fall apart. You'll become wounded. You'll become, as a friend of mine, uh, just a week or so ago, that 120 days after losing his wife, committed suicide. So, be careful. If you've had this thing happen to you, a uh, woman, if you've had lost your man, be careful to stay in the Word. Draw close. The second epistle that Paul wrote to Timothy, he said, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Do you know that God can give you enough inspiration to keep you in focus and, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction? What do we need? I need the doctrine of the Bible right now. I need reproof from God right now. I need correction. And I need instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect. In other words, the Bible is for all mankind the timeless treasures of God and wisdom. Its teachings are of universal application. Isn't this something? That we have a book that reads the same in every language all the way around the world. And every person that uses it as a doctor's book, as a medical book, as a book to heal your soul, it is the spiritual doctor book for your soul. And this is the only place you're going to find the truths that you need. So therefore, you're not limited by time. If you will get yourself in the book, you've got to place yourself apart from the circumstances in the place God would have you be, and that would be following Him. The Bible's for every human being at whatever age and whatever state of life. And his conditions are unfailing guide in the source of inspiration. Paul the Apostle went through life without a wife, without a woman. He said there was times when I would have liked to have had one. But because of the way I lived, and the occasion that I had, and the way I followed Christ, the woman wouldn't be happy with me. And she couldn't stand it. Now my wife put up with me. She put up with me getting on this machine at 3 o'clock in the morning for an hour or so, and putting uh, usurps on, and then coming back and getting in bed. She put up with me doing that for 
three or four years, five years, and never said a word. Never said a word. Never. And Paul's words are amply born out of this uh, presentation of lives of a member of a great woman of the Bible. Here we consider, but a few of the multitude of the people whose lives are recorded in the Bible's vast narrative. Yet the lives of these few women furnish a various range of spiritual excellence no one one man or one woman in any age can fail to find in them an abundance of spiritual profit. The lady that I was married to for 56 years in 1983, well in 1970 uh, to 73, she took the nursery in the first church we went to, and she kept that nursery for nine years. Uh, so in 1983, she took the nursery at Faith Baptist Church, the church I belonged to, and she kept it until she got cancer. From 83 on, she was the head nursery worker, not changeable. She knit a blanket for every baby that was born for those years, since 83 on. We have women in the church now that are grandmothers who have the grandbaby's blanket that my wife knit. And, and mothers and, and, and the, these, these children that have their blankets that, they, that my wife knit them can give them to their children. They already have children that have children. Wow. The truth of Paul's words is amply born out of the presentation of lives of a number of great women. Paul had many great women. He mentioned some of them. Uh, one of them in particular that is mentioned in the Bible is a lady who was a seller of purple and, she, and a giver, I'm sure, and fine linen. And her name is down in the Bible forever. God said that this woman that poured the oil, Jesus said this woman that poured, anointed him, it would be written in the Bible forever to be memorial for her. And so, this was a Mary too. And each of these women are really queens in the eyes of God. They are like prophecies. They are like saints. They were former sinners, active or in the sinful world, and had circumstances that weren't very good. But they triumphed over those and became the women that they were that God came to meet. The very different challenges and the manifestations of the spiritual qualities required to answer the challenges in each one of them's lives. I'm sure that these women had circumstances they had to live above. Anybody living in this world, any time since this world had the sin come into it and Adam and Eve has had circumstances that are trying. But here are some women in here that do not have marks against them after they were saved. They followed God. They had zeal in their lives. They had piety in their lives. They had loyalty. After they repented, the wisdom and the faith and the zeal in God's religion, Jesus Christ. And they followed Him. They had rich diversity in their lives. As a memorial to my wife, I would say, she was probably one of the most godly women that I ever knew. Raised six children. Never in 56 years, even when I was a heathen, 
coming home drunk and doing awful things and everything. She didn't have a complaint. She didn't complain. She accepted me as I was, and she accepted the fact she was my wife, and she was going to be my wife until we died if it killed her. And treated me with love all the way through the whole thing. Abraham was very old. Sarah, his wife, considered herself with a, a dead womb that she couldn't have a child. But God brought forth a child for her. Because she was a faithful woman. Because she was the woman she was. We have another lady in the Bible named Rebecca. A very fair woman to look on. She was one of Abraham's kins, kinsmen's daughters. Abraham had this uh, girl, I, this boy Isaac, by this 99-year-old wife, Sarah. And God had his hand on Isaac and on Abraham. And he sent them over to look for a woman. And he got over there. The man got over there and had these camels with him. Let's just shorten the story a little bit and say he had six camels with him. Never mind all the other stuff. And he said, the woman that will come out and offer me a drink and then offer to water my camels is the woman that I bring back for Isaac. Well, he hadn't been there but just a few minutes and uh, Abraham's servant hadn't and here came come uh, Rebecca and said, can I draw you to drink? And he said, yes, you can. And then she said, I will water your camels. Can you imagine the strength of this young lady? Camels drink roughly about 10 gallons of water each time they drink. If there were six camels there, that's 60 gallons of water. And this lady's going to draw it with a crank thing and a bucket out of the well and pour it in the trough. Do you know they drank a bucket up before she could get another bucket up? That one would be gone. And she had to do that some 60 times or so to get all those camels watered. And not only that, in this setting, if you could see it, this is one well. And there are other herders have come up and now they want to use the well. Remember that the man had to take the top off the well. This was a strong woman, but evidently not strong enough to remove the top off the well. He had to take the top off the well so that the well could be used. So the answer to Isaac's prayer was Rebecca. And she turned out to be the best thing Isaac had in his life. We see a woman, and I'm not going to go into it right now, named Miriam. We see another woman named Deborah. Wow, what a story. Man, she was a, a real queen for God. Then we see Ruth. Ruth is perhaps one of the best known women in the Bible of how she lived her life and how she believed what her mother-in-law told her to do after her husband had been killed and how she would carry on uh, for God in a godly way in the manner that she should and did. We had Abigail. She was married to a rich landowner. 
And she came out, the rich landowner, spurned David. And she was such a woman, even though that rich landowner was ugly, that she calmed David down so he wouldn't come kill her husband and destroy his vineyard. Then we had one of the most precious women that ever, ever lived on this earth. A lady by the name of Esther. A beautiful young lady. That was chosen to be the queen of a man that was perhaps not the most pleasant guy to begin with. But God used her to save his whole nation. The nation of Israel was saved through her and what she did. And then we had Elizabeth and Zechariah, the mother of John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Ghost when Jesus was in his mother's belly, in Mary's belly. And the two bellies touched the, of these women. They were relatives. And John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit in his mother's womb. And so John comes now out of the wilderness 30 years later. But we won't get into that now. And we had Mary of Bethany. She was the sister of Lazarus. And she said, and, and Martha, and they lived in Bethany. And, and she said, if, if Jesus, if you would have come three days ago, he'd have lived. And Jesus said, he's just sleeping. And then, well, then we had Martha, a tender woman, a very gracious woman. Uh, she helped uh, one of the apostles, Thomas, one time, and, and, and she was a gracious woman. Then we had, as I said earlier, the Samaritan woman. A woman, I, I love the fact that Jesus took her. And then we had Mary Magdalene. Mary Magdalene was a woman that lived in Magdala. That's why she was called Magdalene. So Mary Magdalene was not the mother of Jesus. Mary Magdalene was the woman that put the ointment on Jesus that she... Uh, uh, in a sense, baptized in, in the oil. She was uh, doing that for his burial. And uh, she knew he was going to be crucified. And God had showed her. In John's second epistle, he, he uh, writes a letter to the elect lady and her children. I know there's a lot of conference about that. that a lot of people think, well, he was writing to a young church and calling the church the elect lady and the children in the church. But we believe it was a certain lady who had children, but she was so great that she uh, helped and got her name written in the eternal book of love of life. We could go from Genesis to Revelation and pick you out probably 50 or 60 or more women that hold a place in the heart of God. Not everybody holds a place in the heart of God. They're all chose to. But not everybody wants to. And not everybody's willing to. So that's what we need to be. We need to be willing to follow the Lord and give our life to the Lord. And do the best we can for whatever life we have left. Well, this is Brother Peter saying, we'll see you next time. I'm going to try to learn not to ramble. My brother Larry, who is my mentor in this business right here, says, Peter, you ramble too much. My life's been a ramble. <laughs> it's been rambling ever since I was born. It rambled from Maine to Pennsylvania, to New York, to, to Georgia, and uh, all over the place. It's rambled, rambled, rambled. And now here I am, here, coming down to the closing stages. Probably have the idea of doing some more rambling. 
but only for the for God to go out and do some uh, spiritual work, do some first one-on-one, -on -one. drive my camper, and do some one-on-one -on -one work, and maybe if if uh, the door opens, do some evangelizing in, in uh, with group, which I like to do. And uh, I love being around people. I love to have a good time. I love to have a good spiritual meeting, and I like to have a good eating afterwards. <laughs> I like eating some food, too, afterwards. I'm not a man that really hides anything. I'm not ashamed that I like to eat, and I prove it. And most people can today. But after a good meat and a good meal is nice. And enjoy yourself. That's what God planned us to do. Enjoy yourself the rest of our life. And He's going to do it. Listen, you have a good day. And remember, if it's not a godly day, it's not a good day. How can it be a godly day? You get up in the morning, you start with prayer. You do a little Bible reading. You say, well, I'm too busy. Well, then get up earlier. I can practice. I practice that. If I can practice it, you can practice it. I get up two or three times. I'm, I'm, I'm a, I've, I've learned to uh, delegate sleep time and uh, be able to get to where I have the place by myself and I can study and think about the Lord and worship in the Lord and have a good day in the Lord. And you all can do the same. Well, I'll quit rambling and have a good godly day and the rest of the day today. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.